the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. We are rebranding into the Energy MD, so pay attention to that, where we are helping leaders, executives, and everyday people take their energy to the next level so they can have more fun and more success and achieve more in every aspect of their lives. So one of the things that's really important about this whole process is that we focus on mind, body, spirit, and emotions. And so today we're going to be talking about emotions, and we're going to be talking about the limbic system. We're going to be talking about limbic system retraining, and what's really exciting is that I learned about this from our um, our guest today, that there is a bit of a shortcut to resetting the limbic system. And so today we're going to be talking with Sheena Symington. And so she is the director of the Electrosensitive Society, where she helps those people who are electrohypersensitive, EHS. She has a background in biological and environmental sciences and has been researching chemical and electromagnetic pollutants and their effects on natural and human ecosystems for many years. She also works as a research associate with Professor Emeritus Dr. Magda Havis and gives talks on electromagnetic hygiene to help people maintain an electromagnetically clean environment. So we're gonna define a lot of these terms if you're not familiar with them today. Part of an individual's recovery from electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome or EHS often involves resetting the limbic system and reducing the impacts of emotional trauma. Sheena shares a technique developed by Dr. Danielle Assis on a method of eliminating trauma by using the approach of auricular chromotherapy. And we're going to tell you about what that is as well. Sheena, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So let's talk, let's define some of these terms first. So we're all kind of on the, on the same page. So um, let's talk first about, since you are at the Electro Sensitive Society. Well, so let's, yeah, let's define electrosensitive hypersensitivity syndrome, or um, how do you, I, cause I kind of call it electromagnetic hypersensitivity syndrome. Um, how, can you define that and talk about maybe the differences between those two, if there is any? Sure. Um, there are, um, a number of names that has been referred to as electrosensitivity it used to be called neurasthenia, a weakening of the nervous system, microwave illness, radio wave sickness. Um, Dr. Magda Havis refers to it as rapid aging syndrome. Mm. The WHO refers to it as idiopathic environmental intolerance. So again, the, it is an intolerance to electromagnetic fields and they don't necessarily know why. But one thing that Dr. Havis and I have discovered is that there are often involved precursors that really lend itself to you becoming EHS. So um, bottom line is people are disabled in the presence of electromagnetic fields and frequencies. So anything wireless, wireless technology, cell phones, Wi-Fi, cordless telephones, um, electromagnetic fields, so electric fields and magnetic fields, dirty electricity. There's a whole host of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some people are sensitive to the whole spectrum, and some of them are hypersensitive to portions of the spectrum more than others. Okay. And I noticed that you guys preferred to talk about it as electrosensitivity or electrohypersensitivity as opposed to electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Is there a reason for that? A lot of the research, particularly coming out of Europe, uses the term electrohypersensitivity. So just because it's been documented in the scientific literature, it's mm -hmm. often referred to of, at that. But it is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's electrohypersensitivity because we're all quite sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. um, but some of us are disabled or hypersensitive to it. And there's a whole host of symptoms. There's um, sleep disturbances, chronic fatigue chronic pain, short-term memory loss, difficulty concentrating, mood disorders, excessive um, skin problems, dizziness, um, asthma, tinnitus, vision problems, cardiac issues. It's a neurological dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So it has a whole host of symptoms. 
Thank you for that. So can we, can we classify or can we broadly say that anything that gets plugged into the wall or has a battery in it um, can cause somebody who's sensitive to not feel well? Hmm. Um, sometimes, again, too, um, so the, it, it is complicated. So uh, first of all, there's an electromagnetic hygiene, tips to electromagnetic hygiene on my website, electrosensitivesociety.com, because it is kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, because a lot of people will say, um, you know, this um, smart meter is nothing, no different than your radio. You know, mm -hmm. it's radio frequency and okay. your radio, get a, well, your radio is a receiver. It doesn't actually transmit. So the, the smart, meter, smart meter receives and transmits microwave radiation, which is also in the radio frequency rate, um, band, but it's a higher energy than the radio from the, the, the radio waves from your radio. So there's that misconception of whether it's just a receiver, whether it's a transmitter mm. and a receiver. So it's that transmission that's a problem. One of my children, when they were small, they said, so it's like, if you catch the ball, it's okay. But if you catch it and throw it, that's the problem. And I said, exactly. Like, mm -hmm. I think he was five at the time when we were talking about how electromagnetic fields and frequencies work. Um, with a computer, if you're plugged into the wall, you will actually get levels of dirty electricity um, being generated by your computer. But if you use it on battery without being plugged in, then you can get electric and magnetic fields, but not the dirty electricity. So when you talk about just something being plugged in and having a battery, it's not quite that perfectly easy example. But that's why I say to measure it, there's a really great handheld meters that are really inexpensive. Again, I have meter suggestions on my website, um, just documenting what your environment is. You don't have to be afraid of it, but you really need to be aware of what your electromagnetic environment is, particularly in your bedroom environment. Thank you. And so are we talking about wavelengths? Are we talking about frequencies? What are these um, things that people are being exposed to? Mm -hmm. So um, frequencies are number of cycles per second. And on the, on the um, electromagnetic spectrum, um, as you go up, so there's 60 cycles per second, which is what our electricity comes into our houses with. And there are electric fields and magnetic fields associated with that. And on that 60 Hertz um, sine wave, you can have dirty electricity. So there's, a, there's things that ride on the wires. And then there is wireless. So those are in the um, megahertz and gigahertz, so millions and billions of cycles per second, rather than just the 60 cycles per second of your um, wiring in your home. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a frequency base. And as you go up, there's, there's a higher energy. And it's all non-ionizing radiation. And how does that so how does that compare with ionizing? Okay, so this? ionizing radiation, and that's why there's been a little bit of um, controversy saying that, you know, it's not ionizing radiation, so it doesn't break the DNA bonds. So there really shouldn't be a problem. Um, and what it is, it interferes with the repair mechanisms. So it actually interferes with your, your body's natural ability to repair itself, so to repair any damage. So you have those bonds that are broken from oxidative stress and other, other stressors, and they're not repaired effectively. So in the presence of electromagnetic fields, it actually impairs your immune system from functioning properly. So that's why it's so critical when you're sleeping in that bedroom environment at night, eliminating your electromagnetic exposure, because that's when your body heals, recovers, you rest, you digest, you recover. So you're really critical to eliminate it from your bedroom environments. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's being exposed, but not everybody feels badly, at least that they can tell, right? And you talked a little bit about some of the precursors. So why is that? Yeah, I think it's, again, just your ability for your immune system to respond properly, right? So it's what, what else you have going on. So if you have physical trauma, say concussion or whiplash, physical trauma to your central nervous system, that's a precursor. If you have chemical exposure, so you could have pesticides or metals or drugs or even tattoos, mercury fillings, that's another precursor. If you have really, really high exposure, like electrical shock, um, electrocution, a lightning strike, or really high exposure from power lines or antennas or cell phone exposure or Wi-Fi, cordless telephones are really, really bad, that's another precursor. You could have biological trauma, so you could have mold exposure, a high parasite load, or Lyme disease. 
that's another precursor. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have an impaired immune system, like if you have lupus or cancer, or you're very young or very old, if your immune system isn't fully developed yet, then again, you're at high risk. So it's like, it's like a big, a big barrel of toxins mm -hmm. and your, your body just, you know, it doesn't give up, but it's just trying to communicate with you that there's a problem. Yeah, that's exactly the analogy that I like to use is that it's like this big rain barrel and you're just consuming or you're just building up this load over time until eventually um, it overflows and you start to get symptoms. And it's kind of like sometimes the, uh, the electromagnetic fields are kind of like the cherry on top or the straw that broke the camel's back sometimes where people didn't have symptoms until, but oftentimes they already had symptoms and this just makes them feel worse. That's right. Imagine. That's right. And I know um, Dietrich Klinghardt, he said, if you have Lyme disease or, or some bacteria or some, some bugs inside of you, they actually react to the electromagnetic fields too, by giving off toxins and things. So making you feel even worse, because a lot of people um, that had Lyme disease, they didn't realize that their symptoms were so much exacerbated in the presence of electromagnetic fields, but we've seen it over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And again, people don't think of electromagnetic exposure as a toxin. You mm -hmm. know, we think of organic, we want to eat organic food because we know that pesticide use on food is toxic. We know that there's pollution, like we don't think of it as electro smog or electro pollution. And mm -hmm. it very much is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really great awareness. And so in terms of, I'm going to jump right to um, the, the next question that's probably on everybody's mind is that, okay, so then what do we do about these exposures? And when I just wanted to harken back to, I appreciate you kind of bringing in that relationship with the Lyme and the, um, and the fields, the electromagnetic fields and molds also seem to have that relationship. So like all these toxins that are in the body, um, they, they all kind of have this relationship with each other and they all make everything worse. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Very much so. And again, people want to know, okay, so how do we recover? Can we recover from electro hypersensitivity? So the absolute critical piece is you eliminate your exposure, you reduce your exposure, you can only reduce your exposure if you measure your exposure, you need to know what it is, what the sources are, so you can eliminate it. You can have a building biology, building biology specialist come to your home or office, but you can have some handheld meters that really give you an awareness. Um, and sometimes when people have a bit of anxiety, the meters are, um, they're a really useful tool, but they'll say, oh my gosh, like they're, they're, this is so high, what are we going to do? Um, and so many things like a stove, um, the elements on the back of the stove will have a really, really high exposure. So you use the back elements rather than the front elements if you're standing stirring for quite some time. So distance is always your friend but um, you'll measure things throughout your house that are high exposure. But what you wanna really measure is your, um, is your bedroom, places where you spend a whole lot of time. So getting the handheld meters and being able to measure so you can eliminate the exposure, um, it's absolutely critical. And so then when you eliminate your exposure, some people immediately recover. Like that's all they needed to do that toxin. Sometimes they don't recover fully. So they think, oh, well, it must not be that. But again, you have to look at all of those precursors and literally work yourself all the way backwards, addressing those individual precursors in that health and well-being area. Um, and that takes a lot of, um, there's a variety of approaches. We're actually starting the Electrosensitive Society. We've just hosted our first doctor's symposium. And what we want to do is have physicians who are actively treating, diagnosing, and helping prevent EHS, so novel approaches to, to addressing this complex um, set of environmentally induced illnesses. Excellent. Yeah, that's one of the things that I talk about is that, you know, everybody that I see who has low energy and fatigue is that they, they have at least 20 out of the 33 causes that I have found to cause that. And uh, they all, everybody's got a different combination of those, but that all of those are like nails in the bottom of the foot. And all of those nails have to come out in order to decrease the overall burden. Otherwise, for people who are more sensitive to electromagnetic fields, they're not going to be able to have success. That's right. And one of the things that Dr. Magda Havis does here and what we do at the Rose Lab is we hook people up to a heart rate variability monitor. Mm, nice. And we can literally put a Wi-Fi router or a cordless telephone next to them. 
and they don't know if it's on or off. They're, they're blindfolded. So they're just laying on the bed and we plug it in from a different room. So they, they don't know when it's on or off. And with them being plugged in the cordless telephone or the Wi-Fi router, their heart rate literally doubles within a second. And then we unplug the phone, the heart rate goes right back to normal. We plug the phone in, the heart rate doubles. Like for my heart rate to double, I have to go up a flight of stairs. I can't be laying on a, a massage table with a cordless telephone plugged into next to me. So their body is physiologically literally going into fight or flight. So it's um, some, there's a portion of the population that have this physiological response um, and they don't necessarily know why that is so extreme. Um, with the fatigue component, if I had a dollar for everybody, say, I cannot believe my kids stopped wetting the bed when I removed Wi-Fi from my house. I cannot believe the energy I have and the better sleep that I have after I've wired internet in my house. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so important. Um, so you... Um, so let's get into a little bit of, of how to treat the home. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it because you got the, you, the uh, PDF or whatever you have on the website. So when mm -hmm. people, people can go to the website, the electrosensitive society.com and where do they go on here in order to see that? Is that under resources? Solutions. Okay. It's under solutions. Oh, I see that. Okay, great. So reduce exposure. And then there's, oh, so you can click on solutions and then it's got a whole bunch of things. And there's videos there for, so people don't realize that you can actually wire your mobile devices. Like they don't realize that you could use your cell phone in a fully wired manner with zero radiation. So I have a little video on there. So you can access the internet, um, Snapchat, FaceTime, all of that thing all of those things without having any radiation whatsoever. So the, there's a lot of tips to electromagnetic hygiene that are really easy. We wanna make it easy and we wanna make it accessible. And especially those kids, those teenagers, they wanna be connected with their friends and they want those mobile devices. So at least eliminating that wireless radiation component is really critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And then in terms of the testing, um, you talked about a couple of things. I generally advocate for like the Stetserizer for dirty electricity and the tri-field meter and an RF meter. Is there, am I missing anything? No, the tri-field meter, the only thing is that the older ones are a bit misleading because they did not adequately measure microwave radiation, the radio frequency radiation portion. Mm -hmm. The newest tri-field is better. Um, so I really like the, the Safe and Sound or the Safe and Sound Pro or the acoustometer or the acoustometer two. So there are, um, there are a number of small little RF meters that have a great range and a really great sensitivity um, because a lot of people will use an RF meter but it's not sensitive enough and they are sensitive. So they're using the meter, it says, oh, there's no problem but they're still reacting. So they don't think it's the radio frequency radiation. So it's important to get a couple of meters that are um, gonna adequately measure your environment. And yes, the Stetserizers for sure for the dirty electricity and uh, the radio. And I have meter suggestions on that uh, tips to electromagnetic hygiene too. Okay, great. Yeah, we're throwing a lot of information at folks who are watching and listening right now. So just realize that you can go to the website, you can get so much information and we're just kind of touching on it just to kind of give you an idea about some of these things. A uh, question that I have is about mobile data versus Wi-Fi. Which do you think is worse in terms of um, uh, being pathologic, causing issues for folks? Sorry, Wi-Fi and? Mobile data. Mobile data. That or a Wi-Fi? Yeah. Um, the answer is yes, both of them. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. So with on the on the um, like the, I'm holding up a Safe and Sound Pro Two here, and what you can do is get one of these little meters to measure your environment. So not only is that the frequency that you want to measure, but the intensity, and the intensity decreases as you get away from the device. For example. Um, never, ever, ever hold your phone to your head. Never. So have it at an arm's length, have it um, on speaker mode and wiring it. You can totally wire it. You can't make calls, but actually that's not true because you can just go through Skype or through Zoom. 
So you can wire your mobile devices and still have all that. The only time you should be using your mobile device in a mobile way is if you have no other alternative, if you're, if you're out and about and you need to use it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people will say, you know, what is worse? All of it is um, a class 2B carcinogen. All of it's possibly mm -hmm. carcinogenic. So I also think about it too, is that especially these kids, they have their whole lives of exposure. Many of us started our exposure as an adult or close to an adult. So we right. didn't have that really young exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely critical to eliminate exposure wherever you can um, and only use, utilizing it when you, when you need to. Um, so when you were, if you were to measure your phone with Wi-Fi on or with your data on, it's much, if it's a phone just in texting and talking, it's actually relatively low exposure and it'll only have those blips for when you, um, when you send or receive a text. One, um, Dr. Magda Havis, she's doing a, a global emf.net and there's a, a link on my website as well. And it's a citizen science project that she has started to measure RF globally. So everybody that wants to participate in that project gets a discount on the Safe and Sound Pro 2. And they go from all the major, um, all cities in the world we're trying to measure just to start to document low areas and high areas of exposure. And one of the things that we're doing is we had everybody measure their microwave oven. And what an eye opener for people. Their microwave oven is off the charts mm -hmm. and there's sometimes where people are looking in to see if it's cooked or not you know the things going around and around yeah just an enormous exposure for magnetic field but also radio frequency radiation so that's why the meter is really handy is it's it's not meant to induce anxiety in that you know everything radiates but just to eliminate it and especially that bedroom environment because we're going to be exposed to some and just trusting that our bodies can handle it. But it's that bombardment, it's that constant 24 seven, never getting a break from it. Mm -hmm. um, the rats that um, were exposed for 2.4 gigahertz, which is what the Wi-Fi frequency is, um, they, they, didn't have, they had a break and they were still having a higher incidence of cancer. So right now what's happening is we don't even have that break. Like there's, there's not even a few hours because the kids go to school with Wi-Fi and then they go home with their Wi-Fi and they have their cell phones on them and stuff all the time. We need that break, that complete break. And especially if you get it at night, it's ideal. Yeah, so I was gonna say, would that be your number one recommendation right now? So if you can't wire your home for ethernet and you do have, you do have to use Wi-Fi, during the day, would it be to shut off the router, shut off all the phones at night, do your best in that way? Would that be your number one rec? Absolutely. And people, and again, you want to make it easy. So put it on a timer, um, mm -hmm. have, have a, um, you know, like a clicker that you, you push to turn it off. Like you can have them on remotes if you don't want to get up and, you know, or if, if it's a staggered time that you're ending. Um, your use of it at night. But yes, a lot of the doctor's offices and, and clinics that I help accommodate people who are EHS. So I go into hospitals. We have seven hospitals here in Ontario that have eliminated their electromagnetic exposure to in order to accommodate somebody who's disabled by this. So that's no easy feat, right? right. Um, in the middle of COVID, me phoning them up and saying, okay, we need to turn all the electromagnetic fields and frequencies off. Um, can I come and measure and, and help you do that? So we've had some amazing administrators that have that have let me um, do that and accommodate these people um, in that environment. And so it's um, it's just critical to eliminate it in any way that you can. Um, and the, the awareness piece is increasing that there's a need to do that. But um, yes, absolutely at bed at uh, at nighttime for sure. Um, but a lot of the hospitals and clinics that I have eliminated the exposure, they feel so much better. They have so much more energy and they feel better that they actually end up installing wireless technology and eliminating the wireless from their workspaces. So it's been incredible because when people are really in tune with how they feel, you'll notice it. Like, like I, 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 you know, put the Wi-Fi off at night and see how much better you sleep. And some people that have the aura rings or the different types of um, um, devices, you want to have those in airplane mode all the time. You can always put them in airplane mode and the, the Fitbits and all of those things, 
you want to have mobile wireless devices that you can place into airplane mode because they constantly set out a radio frequency signal all the time unless you put them into airplane mode. So you don't want that. You don't want that monitoring your sleep like that. For sure. Excellent. And so then in terms of, and it's more than just Wi-Fi, right? So there's, there's also, um, you can put time, you can put your computers on timers, anything that potentially is like in the bedroom or near the bedroom, like where I am right now, this is my office. And on the other side of this wall is where my daughter sleeps. So at eight o'clock or nine o'clock every night, this whole room gets shut off by a timer. Perfect. Is, is that the kind of thing that you're also- And is it on a power bar? Like everything is on a power bar and it shuts off? Perfect. Yep, that's really good. Um, if you really wanted to go that extra step, you can unplug things because there's that electric field when things are plugged in. Mm -hmm. So you can eliminate that electric field by completely unplugging it. Um, so the, all of those mobile devices, like when I, when I, um, when those wireless earbuds came out, I was at the airport with my, uh, one of my kids and, uh, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is that? And they're like, mom, you can't do that. You cannot talk to them. I'm like, but maybe they'd really want to know. They'd really want to know like the exposure that they're going to have. Right. And so I was like, okay, okay. I won't talk to them. Well, <laughs> So then sure enough, because I was with my kids, I, did, I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. But sure enough, he, um, he came up and uh, was getting something next to me at a little restaurant, like a little, a little kiosk. And I'm like, okay, like, it, it's just the universe telling me that I have to talk to the guy. Right. So I, I said to him, I said, you know, it, they're communicating with each other through your brain. Like, you do not want this. And I said, do you want to listen to what they do? Because I had a meter with me, one of those little wee tiny ones in my purse. Nice. So I took it out. My, my, my son had gone to the bathroom. So that was good. Um, <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was horrified because he's like, how could this possibly be happening? Like, how could they sell these if that's what they do? So again, it's that awareness. Um, and you can really minimize your exposure. People say it's everywhere. Like there, there's Wi-Fi and, and exposure everywhere. Like how are we gonna how are we gonna worry about all that? But again, it's coming back to controlling what you can control, and keeping it away from your body. Don't carry your cell phone actively on your body. Put it in your backpack. Put it, put it in your purse. Put it in your briefcase. Distance is your friend. Only using it when you have to. Speaker phone speaker mode and eliminating in your bedroom and in your home as much as you can. So there are ways to really minimize your exposure. Yep, that's helpful. And, and do you believe that some of these cases, I mean, as long as you're testing, you, you, can, you can tell if the case is working or not, but like the cases or the low EMF headsets, what do you think about those? Yeah, often they're really good. Um, they, if they have, especially like a, a, it's almost like a stethoscope, there's like an air tube component. So it mm -hmm. doesn't transmit through the air. But if it's wire, then it transmits all the way up and down. Um, and, you know, getting some good sources. Um, that's why it's so good to have a meter because you can measure all of that. You don't have to be afraid or intimidated because technology is going to continue to to take place that, um, you know, advances that you, you want to be aware of. Not uh, not intimidated by one thing about a lot of people will get into um, shielding uh -huh. and say, OK, they they're going to shield this place. And you want to be really, really careful. You want to have it done properly, because sometimes if you put a block up, some shielding, some RF blocking paint or something metallic will reflect and re-radiate the radio frequency out. Um, you want to make sure you don't make a situation worse. Because sometimes if you don't know where the source is coming from, you can put up a block and it, it goes into the block and then bounces back into your living spaces. So you want to be really, really careful at any kind of remediation or trying to block something away from your environment. Eliminate and, and turn everything off within your house. But if there are external sources, get a, get a professional in to help you how to really, truly minimize your exposure. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons why people will generally feel much better in nature, right? Oh, nature is so comforting. And I just have, you know, I have more energy or I feel more connected. And a lot of people don't realize that some of that has to do with their internal environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. Their living environment. And that's what people say when I go camping, they used to think it was just because they were away from the stress of their job or the, the hustle and bustle. 
often it's electromagnetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Just being outside at the beach, you know, like there, yeah, there's lots of benefits to that. And out in the sunshine, you know, we've given the sun a, a bad rap with all the sunscreen and stuff. We, we evolved with that. We need it so much to power up our mitochondria for sure. For sure. So let's pivot into limbic system resetting, limbic system retraining. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what the limbic system is? Yeah, the limbic system is that emotional response, that uh, emotional center, what sends you into flight or fight, what with that emotional component of your of your brain. And um, the auricular chromotherapy is it's an auricular chromotherapy that um, the um, limbic system is, a, there, is um, there are points on your earlobe, acupuncture points, that are associated with the limbic system of your brain. So the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, there are regions of psychic scars, what they call it, regions on your earlobe that are associated with that memory and the limbic system. So that's why with trauma, it gets kind of stuck in the memory and in the limbic system um, to create trauma. And some people that are, have had a traumatic episode, they literally get stuck in that flight or fight. Sometimes they shake, sometimes they, and they have both a psychological response, but often a, a very physical response as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and how the limbic system affects the hormones and, and That's everything right. else. Yeah, it is definitely going to be global. Mm -hmm. So the technique that we're talking about today, this shortcut to resetting the limbic system, you mentioned auricular chromotherapy. So the auricular refers to the ear, right? Chromo is color. Um, and it's actually photochromotherapy, right? Yeah, it's like colored light on your ear. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so this tell us a little bit about this technique. Okay. So with the, the training that Dr. Assis does, he says with every um, trauma, you have a worst moment. You have a worst moment that when you think of that trauma, when you're upset by what happened, that moment comes to you. It often comes to you in a feeling, but there's often a visual associated with that worst moment. So when he asks his patients to think of that worst moment of their trauma, the earlobe becomes sensitive. So if you actually just kind of squeeze the earlobe, it's sensitive when you think about a trauma. And sometimes if the trauma is greater than six months prior, the left ear is more sensitive. Sometimes if it's more recent within six months, the right ear is more sensitive. Sometimes it's opposite for right or left-handed. So you check that. So you ask the person to close their eyes, bring up the absolute worst moment of the trauma, and then see which ear is more sensitive. Once you find out which ear is more sensitive, then you get the auricular chromotherapy light. You can show it up and the, 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 there's a little bit tiny light and it's yellow for the um, trauma treatment and um, you shine it on that sensitive point. You have them maintain the image in their ear, in their mind, and you ask them what emotions are associated with that image. So some people are, they'll say pain, they'll say hurt, they'll say agony, they'll say guilt, whatever, whatever their feeling is. And what do they say to themselves? What is that word that they say? What is that sentence that they say to themselves about the trauma? So you ask them what they say to themselves, you scale the emotional response in the zero to 10, how strong that emotional feeling is. And then you shine the light on that sensitive part on their earlobe for three minutes. And during that three minutes, you watch them very carefully. And sometimes they, um, they have rapid eye movements. Sometimes they like, it's just a very, very obvious going from trauma to calm over those three minutes there, they, they let you, their face relaxes, their body language relaxes. They can breathe better. They're breathing deeper. After the three minutes, you ask them what happened to the image. And they often say like with a very puzzled look on their face that they, they can't get the image. Like it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And then you ask them about the emotion, how strong that emotional response is. And it's often zero or two, whereas before, before the treatment, it was 10. 
And then you ask them, you know, what do you say to yourself um, about this trauma? Um, you know, prior, it might be that uh, they could never get over this trauma. And now it's like, you know, I, I can move through this. I, I feel calm. I feel peaceful. And then they also, um, when, before, you're, before you're treating them, you ask them where they feel it on their body. You ask them if there's a physical sensation with it. And often if it's a, a loss, like let's say it's a, a death of a family member or something, they often feel it in their chest. And if you have a um, physical sensation that still remains after your um, yellow light treatment on the earlobe, you use the blue light and that's in the conscious. So in that opening of your earlobe. Mm. sorry not your lobe but your ear part the opening and you shine the blue light in there and that often um, abates those physical sensation okay on the same ear on the same ear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and so for those people who aren't familiar with light therapy can you tell us a little bit about you know people may be familiar with red light therapy or mm -hmm. you know infrared saunas and and some of that mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about light therapy so people kind of understand that there is science behind it yeah there's um there's a lot of information like on low level light therapy in general um and the healing properties of that the different colors have different um wavelengths so they they penetrate the body in different um depths and yellow is often just with that emotional component. So Dr. Assis, that's what he does. He does a lot on color therapy on various colors for things. And he found that that light for trauma just has that photon resetting of the, the amygdala, of the, the brain and that limbic system, as well as the memory. So it's, um, you know, so many people say like, but like, how does it actually really work? And it is quite fascinating. Like there's not... Um, you know, and Dr. Assis can, can talk to it a little bit more about how it actually works other than it just, it just, it's like, it's like an information or it's like, there's a block there. It's like the trauma, um, splits the brain. It, it, it disintegrates the integration of the left and right hemisphere. And for some reason, just shine that light on those acupuncture points helps with the integration and it just the energy flows and it just it just remedies the memory of that trauma like we're talking like there was one um person that was helped they had a car accident and they had, were rolling and they thought they were going to to die it was a traumatic incredibly scary experience and so they brought up that image of rolling and 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 uh, distress and the light was shone on the ear and then literally went from tears of trauma to tears of relief because it was like a, a black screen had just come down and there was just no image to access. And the feeling of fear went from a 10 out of 10 to a zero out of 10 within three minutes. Mm. So I just see this as such an incredibly helpful tool. Mm. One thing that, I, that I'm most impressed by is the work that he does with children because um, imagine these young children that have traumatic events of losing a loved one or having an accident or something really, really significantly traumatic in their lives and being able to have this released. So mm -hmm. they, um, they, don't, they don't have to say anything, but what they do with children is they say, um, why don't you draw a picture of what you think of about losing your, your father, for example, and they'll draw a picture and then they do the auricular chromotherapy. They ask them which ear is uh, more sensitive. So they squeeze each earlobe and see which one's more sensitive. And then they do the yellow light on the earlobe and then they get them to draw again. And the before drawings compared to the after drawings are just miraculous. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just, it actually is like too good to be true. Like it seems too good to be true in my, I do a monthly training seminar for um, for practitioners and i have so many practitioners that keep on coming over and over again um because they keep on thinking like it can't be that simple like it that's it like there's mm -hmm. nothing else to <laughs> to, to, to learn right. and so i started a working group of those who are practicing this as a as a therapeutic practice within their practice and that's a great information sharing opportunity for those practitioners 
Excellent. Yeah. And that's, that's how I learned about it. I heard Dr. Hava speak about it and she mentioned that you have this training available and then I attended that and that's how I met you. And yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely amazing. I remember the, uh, in the training, there was the example of Dr. Assis doing the procedure on a woman and um, yeah, she couldn't just that look on her face, you know, she just couldn't access the memory anymore. She, and it's kind of like, I know that this is, this is in my past and I know that it's there, but it just doesn't have that grab. It doesn't have that heaviness anymore. And one of the examples that I really loved is um, there was a 20 year old that was traveling with a drunk driver and she was in the car and it was, they were going hundred miles an hour and she was terrified. Mm. And 10 years later, she couldn't drive herself on the, on the highway. And so they treated her for the historical um, trauma of driving with a drunk driver and then for the left ear and then on the right ear which was happening now it was a current situation they said bring up the level of anxiety that you feel when you think about driving on the highway and so she did that and then they treated the right ear and she was driving within a week so the applications with trauma but also anxiety that could be linked to that trauma of it happening again or something else going on such a powerful powerful technique that um you know can be so utilized and so simple yeah and then how long does a treatment last it's with that trauma it's just gone it's just gone so in the paper that i have posted on the website with the auricular chromotherapy from dr c they had a 93 percent success in treating trauma Tell me any therapy <laughs> that you have that has a 93% success rate. With one treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then so in terms of the ability for somebody to do this, can anybody get access to the protocol? And can anybody just say, hey, I'm going to do this on my friend now? Um, you know, I can't say what anybody can do <laughs> and what they can't do. Um, but you really want to be careful um, trauma is traumatic <laughs> mm -hmm. and playing around with trauma can be very very difficult for the the recipient um, if it's not done properly in a very safe place in a very um you know well-informed educated approach so that's why i love to train practitioners really that are already familiar with trauma and that, that have that kind of um, that background, because there's a there's a certain sense of, um, you know, there, 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 there's that holding space that's so critical because it's, um, you know, it's it's it, like some of these traumas are quite extreme and um, you would never want to exacerbate somebody's um, trauma that they're experiencing just by not being able to, to hold that space of, of trust and, and knowledge properly. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that you said that because that is important. And so, you know, doing it with a provider or somebody who's kind of trained in it um, is really the best way to go. In terms of having those side effects, what have you seen? What have you heard in this uh, practice group? Um, I'd be curious. Mm -hmm. And I think too, um, it's interesting because it seems so simple and I think it is, but there's an intuitive component to it. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, which trauma do we do? And you, know, you, you do the worst one and the patient always knows what the worst one is. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people want to deal with a, a, a more recent trauma. And then um, I'll ask, you know, what, what was the very first time you felt like this? So you try and get back to that very first. It's the earliest um, significant impacts that are sometimes the most traumatic. So it's the worst and often the first. Um, so the, the patient always kind of knows. Um, and again, too, I think a lot of these practitioners, they're very sensitive, right? They don't want to make things worse. But ironically, sometimes when their patients have a lot of anxiety, sometimes the practitioners have quite a bit of anxiety too. Like they, they kind of resonate up with that anxiety. Um, so again, starting with really easy um, traumatic events, like very discreet, because sometimes there's ones that are, um, you know, like if you have a whole lifetime of a, 
you know, a very traumatic childhood that involves a whole lot of incidents. Like there's, there's not just one discrete moment of, uh, you know, a dog attack, for example, or, or something that's very discreet. That mm. seems to be easier when you have traumas that, um, you know, you have some people that they have, they have trauma throughout their whole lives. Like, where do you kind of even start even more of a reason for why you need somebody who's really, um, you know, educated well and, and, and uh, has experience with that type of, of traumatic um, treatment. Because sometimes I've, I've heard with the EMDR, and sometimes when you have a brain injury, and a lot of people that are EHS, that it's literally like a brain injury for them, um, they're hard, they are not able to follow as well with the, the back and forth with their eyes with the EMDR. Um, so the neat part about this auricular chromotherapy is you don't even actually have to talk about the trauma. You mm -hmm. don't even need to know, like the practitioner doesn't even need to know what the trauma is. So how beautiful, especially for those kids and those adolescents and those teens and those early 20s, they don't want to even deal with the trauma themselves. So sometimes talking about it actually prevents them from dealing with it. So they can come, you can ask them what the emotion is, how strong it is, and treat it without even knowing what the trauma is. So it, it provides a real avenue for treatment that so many other modalities don't offer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And so then bringing it back to the EHS, the electro hypersensitivity syndrome, mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing with this technique and the, that condition? I'd like to do some more research on this because with COVID, it's harder to be treating people um, in person. Mm -hmm. So I haven't um, been able to access as much as I could, uh, I would like to. One thing I'd really love to research more is that blue light impact on the physical symptoms for EHS, because mm -hmm. that's of great interest to me. Um, sometimes there's a lot of tinnitus, um, headaches, all sorts of physical pain. But again, you have to reduce your exposure and then do any kind of treatments. So it's kind of like, you know, you're drinking dirty water, you go to the doctor, you get the medication, you come back, you keep drinking the dirty water, you go back to the <laughs> like, like you have to, you have to eliminate your exposure and then start to do some of these things. So I think the trauma piece is huge. And I'd love to do some research on that. How does it impact, particularly with that blue light for the physical symptoms? Wonderful. Yeah. And it seems like it's just one, another one of those things that's in that big barrel, you know, the trauma. So they can be, there can be mental, emotional, physical, spiritual toxicities over our lives that just kind of build up over time. That's right. And I see too, um, a lot of people fixing that trauma or eliminating that trauma and then looking at you know, their anxiety, like anxiety plays such a role in everyone's lives. Like I, I never really realized it so much. Um, we think everything matters, uh. everything. And once you start to realize that mm, most things don't matter at all, <laughs> um, you can really get to a place of peace and, and, and good health and those relationships just when it's easy, that's, that's the right path, right? So when you get stuck in flight or fight with those traumatic events, really resetting that traumatic response. And then, you know, what is the person's self-talk? Like, do they feel enough? Like all of us were parented with them, um, you know, do this, do that, do this. All that messaging was that we weren't, what we were doing wasn't quite enough, you know? So, you know, you're just shifting that, that kind of anxious thinking that um, the whole world seems to have um, after you reduce that trauma, it's incredibly effective at people really regaining their health on that spiritual and emotional level. So important. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about, we're just about out of time here. So appreciate you taking the time. We've talked about EHS. We talked about the photochromo auriculotherapy. Um, anything else you feel like our audience needs to know um, before we kind of dive into your website and some of these other things that uh, we're going to be sharing with them. Any last thoughts for the, um, the audience? Um, I think too, people say, oh, that, that EHS, that must be horrible for, for those people. Mm -hmm. um, it really impacts all of us. And so really reducing it as a toxin in our lives is, is so critically important. 
and getting out in nature, the, some of the research that we do on the pulse electromagnetic field therapies and the light therapies and all that kind of stuff, you know, getting out, going for walks in nature, grounding, um, getting into water and getting out into the sunshine, so incredibly important. And, you know, one thing I've, I've seen with COVID and many other places, people are kind of getting back to nature getting back to away from the computers more and, and, and getting outside and growing their own food and being more connected with the land. I think it's so, so important. So minimizing that electromagnetic exposure and getting outside. Great words. And there's a lot of really great information on your website, which is at electrosensitivesociety.com. And we will drop that link below. And is there anything in particular that you want people to go to that website and do first? Um, there's, there's a couple of things, like there's a questionnaire there. Like some people think, well, you know, I might be electrosensitive. Like, how do I know? Mm -hmm. So there are, there are questionnaires that you can fill out to try and tease out whether you are electrosensitive. It's never, ever going to hurt to eliminate your exposure. And I can help you do that. We have a weekly support group for those who are electrosensitive. Um, I help people accom be accommodated with their hospital, within their homes, within their workplaces, if they have electrosensitivity. So helping people make it easy to eliminate their exposure. It's just an awareness. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a resource. I don't charge anything. I'm a free resource for them. When people take the auricular chromotherapy training, if you're interested in that, just drop me an email on my website. I ask them if they want to make a donation to the electrosensitive society, because what's happening is people are literally becoming homeless. One thing that we absolutely critically need is safe, low radio frequency radiation spaces for these people to live. Because when some, when a neighbor does something or a cell tower goes up, you're not safe in your own home anymore. So really getting these people um, that are so sensitive, safe places to live. And that's why we're starting in that Magda with the global emf.net finding those really low radio frequency areas and then and then trying to get some land to uh, to be set aside for safe spaces for people so yeah and again learning more about it and supporting those who have this uh, disability is really important really appreciate you having me on today so thank you so much agreed yeah sheena this was really wonderful so appreciate you taking the time and sharing your knowledge with us today mm, thank you I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter where I share all important facts and information about fatigue, from the foods and supplements to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, it's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening and have a nice day.